So we are embarking on uh, the anniversary of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, the, the famous Moshe uh, that was able really to to bring the, the words of the creator into the, the five different books of Moses, uh, which we call the Old Testament, the Bible. Uh, we know that uh, Moses was uh, extremely coded. Therefore, the, the Torah was uh, misunderstood for, for generation after generation, uh, till uh, there was a promise that Moshe will reincarnate in every generation in order to elevate the consciousness of humanity. And we know that in every generation, we have uh, the soul of Moses coming and actually bringing uh, the secrets that he received on Mount Sinai uh, in, in the everyday language uh, in order for people really to evolve, in order for people really to understand what's, what's the trick of life, what's the meaning and the purpose of life. So... It, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to go through different sections uh, from the Zohar today, which uh, discuss about the power of Moshe. But we know Moshe it's the numerical number of Ratzon, and Ratzon means desire, yeah, and not by coincidence the the number fifth name of the seventy two names. Uh, sorry, it's the fifth name. I already forgot. Memeshin, the name of, of healing, not by coincidence, it's, uh, it's, it's the same letters of Moshe, Memeshin. Uh, and so we know that we're talking about healing and there are so many people that stick in the world and got sick over the different periods of time. Uh, there are people that uh, don't get sick physically, but uh, unfortunately, they, they have a lot of trouble in their mind that cause them to, to different kind of uh, uh, mental disorders, you can say. And uh, doctors took the advantage of it and wrote like so many syndromes and so many uh, different scenarios and so many different names to different diseases that's related to the mind. So in a way, if, if we are healthy physically, it's not necessarily that we are healthy mentally in, in a perfected way. Yeah, because what is the perfected way? It's like to understand that everything comes from the light. Everything is good in this world. Therefore, I need to be excited and happy in every given moment. And we know that most of us uh, are not there. Uh, the term Kabbalist was given to people that were capable to come to that level of consciousness. Uh, and that's the reason they left all those scriptures thousands of books in so many different ways and approaches just to for one goal that we can come to the level of happiness that we can come to the level of true fulfillment in our lives so when moses put together the the five books he didn't try to describe any any history event everything was perfectly conducted and scribed in a way that there are so many secrets there only only for the people that are going to go about and, and want to understand what is behind religion, what is behind the Torah. So we know that on Mount Sinai, 3,500 years ago, there wasn't any establishment of any religion it was a technology that was given through the creator uh, using moses as a channel because he, he was the only conduit that were able really to deliver this kind of electricity he was the only pure vessel that was able to to take something so intangible as the creator and contracted into words, into something that can use as a code later on. And with, you know, in the past hundred years that this, the center is celebrating, uh, we've been able to decode so many, so many of, of those amazing teachings that coming from the, the Old Testament through the Zohar, of course, because the Zohar 
uh, is written by the reincarnation of Moses 2000 years back, which is, which is uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. For the purpose, really, so we can start understand the different secrets. So one of the favorite statements of the Zohar about Moshe Rabenu that he never, never die, actually. Never die. What does it mean? Uh, Moshe Rabenu, uh, with some other righteous souls throughout the history of time, like Elijah the prophet, uh, they say about, uh, about uh, Jacob that he never died. So this is the reason there is no description also of their burial place. For some reason, it says that they, they, they got to such a perfected state that uh, their body, I know it's hard to understand, but the body they, and not get decayed uh, by time, by space, by, by, by the physical reality. And therefore, they would have an access to exit this world without going through the process of death. So, so why we are celebrating a death anniversary today if, if he never died? No, it's, uh, it's funny. But we know that many of those Kabbalists, because they perfected their state of being in terms of, it means that they corrected their, their body consciousness. To, to the level that the atoms doesn't have any more any desire to receive within them for themselves. All what they were about is like a sunshine that projects energy towards humanity. And therefore, it says that even those, those Kabbalists that were buried, their body was intact when they had to open some of those tombs, some of those graves of some Kabbalists, because they, they died in different places that uh, the mayor uh, at that time decided to build a, a road on. So there were rare occasions. And when they open, when open up the, it wasn't a gasket, you know, it's, it's a different way that the uh, Kabbalistic way to bury people. They found that the bodies look like shiny and it's not intact even after hundreds of years. How can we come to that state? that we are transforming the desire to receive, which, which it's so much attached to the body energy, the demand of the body that always is in demand of give me, give me, give me, I need this, I need that, I need rest, I need pleasure, I need massage. I need, you know, the body is constantly demanding from us and it's so noisy. And the mind on top of that, it's so noisy. What will be, what will be the future? What happened yesterday? Why this guy did that to me? You know, the mind is constantly bombarded with these thoughts. So how, how can we get out of that loop? It's a, it's a question for us. So that's, that's what we can receive today. Because Moses, he, he considered to be already in, in, to, to receive such a robotic consciousness of light, what we call. So it means that you, you can come to a level where they say that he was half an angel, half a human. That's the, that's the level that he reached, you know? Half, a, half an angel, half a human. Can you imagine? All the tremendous efforts that he made to, uh, to gather those special soul called the Israelite at that time. And from where he started, he started very late in his life. He was able really to, to create what we call the Exodus of Egypt, uh, which means that most of those special souls were, were in a trap, were in a loop, that there was no way out of there. It's, it says that they reach, and we, we're going to get into it towards Pesach, but they reach the, the 49th level of, of negativity. It, it means that if they went another step downwards, uh, humanity will destroy it completely. So, and it says that it wasn't that bad for them. In, from their point of view, they, they enjoy good living. 
the slavery wasn't a slavery of bondage of, of the physical. It was the slavery pretty much of the consciousness. So they had good life, they had pleasures, they had, uh, they had all the, the food that is necessary. And after the exit, Egypt, they complained, say, where, where is all, all the good food that we used to have? And now we are in the desert, need to eat uh, this uh, jelly kind of uh, bread called the bread of heaven. Uh, you know, it's like the, the same uh, porridge that they used to eat in the, in the metrics. I don't know if you remember the first Matrix uh, movie, you know, so they, they're giving them this port, say, listen, this is what we have to give you, you know, if you want to get out of the Matrix, this is what you have to eat. But now in the new Matrix, in the resurrection, say, you know what, we came into a technology that we don't need to eat this, no longer this disgusting porridge. So they start developing, uh, I don't know if you saw the new one. <laughs> You haven't seen it yet. You're ruining that for me. What do you mean? It's like uh, it's like an old movie already. <laughs> movie, it's movie. Already. The resurrection. <laughs> so, so they said. So it's an interesting question that when I saw this movie, I said, "Wow!" Like the opponent was able even to penetrate the people that got out of the matrix because they start really establishing again materialism. The whole point that it's to get rid of uh, of material materialism attachment isn't it so the idea is that each and every one of us and what moses did it's we we are starting the process really from purim that's going to happen next week it's going to be from purim to to Pesach. it's going to be exactly 30 days 30 days and the 30 days, it's really a, an amazing pro process that we have to prepare ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves for the, the exodus of our old consciousness, Wh wherever it is, you know, we all, we all are in different states of mind, in state of tikkun, which is, which is okay, yeah? We all in different states, but we know that the goal is really to escalate and elevate and constantly grow. But some of us could be stuck in a place that we, we don't feel that there is an ability for more growth. We don't feel that. It's like we are convinced that uh, we are, you, you know, we are a done product. Yeah, that's it. This is it. This is the product. There is no way to upgrade it. And that's that's what Purim and Pesach is all about, coming to start uh, pinching in those shells to allow us to see that uh, freedom is there for us from, from all the old stories that we've been convinced by ourselves and by, you know, our friends that, you know, judging us or telling us who we are, our friends, our colleagues, whoever it is, our parents, our teachers, Whatever it is, and of course, we are the, the worst enemy because we have our mind constantly. You know, that, that's the one thing that we remain with all the time, our mind. You know, sometimes you meet someone that uh, he said something to you and you go home and you start replaying it over and over and over. Why he said to me, why he did it to me, why did it? And yeah, he's wrong. And you start like having like this deep conversation about, you know, it's like such a waste of energy at times. Yeah, there are times that I have to, to do some kind of a chuva, some kind of a calculation, what I did, what I've been, what happened during the day. But it said it's not supposed to take more than 10, 15 minutes before I go to sleep. This is the time of chuva. This is my personal Rosh Hashanah when I do that. But the rest of the time, I need to, to try to, to achieve leadership. Leadership, it means that I need to lead myself and be able to, to lead others. So it says about Moshe that the all 600,000 souls that he was leading to begin with, in the end, the, in the Exodus, they were attached another 3 million, uh, what we call mixed multitude, that just enjoy the miracles that happen and say, we want to join the party. <laughs> um, but those 600,000 souls says that they, all of them were part of Moses' soul. It means that 
he didn't really have a choice. It means that they, they were part of who he is. That's the reason he, he had to lead them. And you see at times in your life that there are people that attach to us. Uh, and there are conflicts and there are ups and downs and everything, uh, but their karma is attached to us, especially it's with siblings. Uh, once it was with marriage, but today, you know, when you get married, you already signed uh, the divorce document just in case to save time, you know? So you, you're already doing the prenups. You're already signing a, a death decree to this marriage. So many go, doubts already. Yeah, this is the prenup. This is what going to happen, if yes or not. So this is a real union. But once, you know, like my parents, uh, they stuck together. Uh, by hook or by cook, what you say, you know, <laughs> hating each other for years, but uh, attached, you know, nothing can, uh, nothing can really uh, take them apart. It's interesting, uh, you know, and uh, the Rav, when the Rav, our teacher used to marry people, says that the glue used to be so strong uh, and all, all the Kabbalists, they, they use the union of marriage in order really to glue the souls that to understand that it's not made to, to be fragmented. It means that they need to stick together and do their tikkun together. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, it's going to be... It's going to be harsh. Yeah, it's going to, to have so many ups and downs, but the glue is going to be so strong that uh, both people will grow out of it and going to go grow stronger and hopefully with more love too. Yeah. So he was married to the Israelite. He, he really, the moment he realized that, that, uh, that his soul is kind of the father's soul for all of them. Mm -hmm. So... When you realize that, then you take leadership. You he didn't want to take leadership. He was a Pisces. Any any Piscean here today? Augustine, I didn't know you're Pisces. Yeah. I would completely change my uh, you know, my way with you. <laughs> oh my God. So you know, Pisces is someone that doesn't want to take leadership. I'm telling you. Is that true, Ben? I don't know. There is maybe two that I know that took uh, good leadership. It's uh, one is David Guillaume, uh, which is a Pisces. Is, yeah. And the second is Tony Robbins, by the way. <laughs> Tony Robbins is actually born on the, on the full moon of Pisces. He's an interesting soul. He's doing great work uh, in, a, in a different level. It's, it's different than Kabbalah, but it's, it's, uh, he has responsibility for specific soul in this world to help them. But we know that since Kabbalah, it's the deepest, the, the Zohar is the deepest, like what we're doing today, says so soon we're going to move to a section from the Zohar. Uh, what we're doing today, uh, one hour of studying Kabbalah from the Zohar, it says that it's equal in its magnitude, energetic magnitude of the energy that I'm receiving. It's not necessarily something that, uh, you know, uh, you injected yourself with steroids. It's not something that's supposed to feel, but it's the infusion that your soul gets. It's equal to one year of any other teaching. One year. One hour equal to one year. Imagine yourself. So I hope it's, uh, you know, just inspiring you to get him to study even more the Zohar. So especially today, Moses wrote the Zohar. Moses wrote the biblical text. The same soul that have to come is responsible because we are also fragments of those original 600,000 souls. You know, it says that it's something interesting. What happened in the Exodus of Egypt that in the in the plague called the darkness, darkness it called, you call it Choshech, Makat Choshech. Darkness. Darkness, okay? So it says, there is a coded thing in the Bible that says, Chamushim Alu Bnei Israel. It says that only one to 50 survived darkness, even from the Israelites. 
was the dark was so strong. You know, imagine yourself like to, to be like a blind person. There were no projectors, there were nothing. And when this darkness plague took place, the weak of the Israelite also died. It wasn't just the Egyptians that died. So there were many people that were lost even before the Exodus, because the Exodus took, uh, you know, happened only two nights later. So what we are trying to say here, that what we can receive in, during this day is really to understand that uh, there is limitless level, limitless level of responsibilities that we can take and look for. So right now we don't realize what the circle of souls that are depending on us, mm -hmm. not necessarily realizing that. Because if we realize that, we would chase after them mm -hmm. to, to help them to, to pull them out or to elevate them, yeah? And also you would chase after the one that is responsible for you to help you and to pull you up from where you are to your next level. But we are in com complacency, what we said. But today we can awaken that uh, by understanding <clears throat> that the leadership that uh, Moses took, he didn't want, uh, but he was the only conduit. He says that, you know, leadership is, is not about, it's not for someone that he want to be the leader. Usually the true leader doesn't even want to be the leader. He wants to be busy in other things. Why is that? Because the force of the opponent making sure that the person that is capable, the person that can reveal a lot of light, this is the exact person that is mind gonna be occupied with different things other than helping others. Okay, so Moses was a, was a leader, but he was a leader of ships. In, the, in his beginning period, you know, but he's, he was doing it so well in such a, in, in such a perfection, in such a, in, in such a care and love, even to those cattle that he was leading, that he, the creator identify, identify that say, this is the leader that I'm looking for. This is the leader that I'm looking for. So let's start reading uh, some verses from the Zohar. I'm going to uh, be able to share that with you. There are many sections. Uh, maybe I can uh, email you the sections from the Zohar where Moses is mentioned. Okay, so this is from a portion Noah. And this verse 92. Okay, yeah. Okay. Amar Abichia, Noach de Avat Tzadik. I'm going to read the Aramaic first, so our soul, just say, uh, you can close your eyes and allow your soul really to, to tune to these vibes. Amar Abichia, Noach de Avat Tzadik. Amai la va batil mota me alma, el a begin de ad la salkat zo ama me alma. Vod inun lo avu me min be begusha berhu be kuluach gameta fail and narrit tami de chamber ruach meseva. Rabbi he asked, If Noah was a righteous man, did it not cancel death over the world, just as it was cancelled at the time of the giving of the Torah? in relation to Moses, of course. And he answered, because the pollution of the serpent had not yet been removed from the world, and because the people of the world had no faith in the Holy One, blessed be he, as a result, they clung to the leaves of the lower tree, the external forces, and covered themselves with a spirit of the filament. So we know that Noah had the merit to save humanity, but to take only a fraction, only a sample of humanity, and start the world afterwards. And the rest of the world was destroyed. 
And he was prepared to that. For 120 years, he built the ark. But the question was about him. He says, how could he make really the true effort to change the decree? So the Zohar said, you know what? They, the humanity didn't have the merit yet. They weren't ready. So the same people of the flood is the same people eventually that reincarnated into the, the scene of the golden calf, the receiving of the Torah, they were more ready. But even though after receiving the Torah and the removing of death, even then they fell. So this story is repeating itself over and over again. But how come he didn't fight? You know, he, he received a message from the creator. Listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy the world. But why for 120 years, he didn't try to remove the decree. Instead, we just prepared the ark to save, you know, the fraction, the sample of humanity so he can start a new humanity with. And that was uh, the difference between Moshe and, and Noah. So even though their soul says like eventually, they're both coming from the same root of soul of Abel, kind and Abel, yeah? So Noah started the correction of Abel, but he was not able to finish that correction. He was, he says that he was righteous in, in, in his generation, but if he was living in the time of Abraham, probably he wouldn't consider to be righteous. Then the generation was so low in consciousness in his time that he was considered to be righteous. So he was chosen by the creator. It says that eventually Moses got the same opportunity, but instead of allowing the creator, because the creator suggested Listen, humanity is falling and falling and falling. Let me re reset it again. Let me destroy them. And I will, the creator said to Moses, I will build from you a new nation. And then Moses says, no, no, I'm not accepting it. You know, this is, this is the level of self-sacrifice, of understanding that he had, that he had to fight for the generation. And that's what many Kabbalists did and doing till this very day. You know, when we're talking about, about uh, the process of establishing the center by, or continuing the center by the Rav and Karen at the time, they had to add tremendous fight and opposition on their leadership or what, what they were trying to do just to raise the consciousness of humanity. So there are so many excuses that came from so many different channels, the channels, uh, political channel, the religious channel, but there are so many from the secular channel, from every channel there was any excuse why we shouldn't do what we're doing. Uh, but the, the Rav insisted and fought and was able to, uh, to break down the iron curtains around around the shell that was around the true wisdom. And, and that's created an enormous revolution, spiritual revolution. And that's only because the Rav felt responsible. So if I'm not going to do it, maybe it's going to take thousands of years in, in the process of gradual uh, evolution that it will happen. So we have to try to fasten the process. And that's the reason also Moshe wasn't able to, to get into Israel. He wasn't able to get into Israel. So the Torah said there that he was punished because instead of eating, uh, eating the rock, he was supposed to speak to the rock and he kind of disobeyed what the creator told him to do. That was one of, his, one of the things. But in reality, his desire says by Hanan, 519 times he begged to the creator, let me in, let me in. Even though the creator says, no, that's it. You know, you're not getting in. It's uh, Joshua is going to take the, the people to Israel. You are not getting in. That's it. It's done. But he insisted and begging for five, for more than 500 times to the creator, let me in. Was it selfish? You said, oh, I accomplished so many things and now I did so much effort and I'm not able really to get into the country, to the land, to, the, to this 
consciousness, new consciousness called Israel. I am not able to get into it. No, it was because in his mind and all the time in his mind, he wanted to finish the global correction. And you, the moment his soul will step into the land of Israel, that's it. It's the end of the game. It's the end of correction for humanity. This is the reason he insisted. And, and that's what the Kabbalists did. They, they went, they're always going against the rules of cause and effect. They're bringing mercy upon the rules of cause and effect. Because cause and effect always will lead to judgment. Cause and effect is judgment. It means you did that, you received that. Judgment. But what the Kabbalists used to do, bring mercy, enormous amount of mercy, uh, no matter what. So let's move to the next verse. Let me find which is it. One eighty four. This is the Zohar online, what you're seeing here. So just in case you don't have the full Zohar, you can log into that and be able to study the, you see the Aramaic and the English translation. So 184 is here. Okay, I'm gonna read again the Aramaic. ולה שביק לה לקודשה ברכו עד דמסר גרמה למותה. לכתיב, ואתה אם תישא חטאתם, ואם אין, מכני נא מספריך אשר כתבת. וקודשה ברכו מכילון, לכתיב, וינחם השם על הרעה וגומר. ונוח לעבד כן, אלא בעל השתעזבה ושבי כל על מה. אוקיי, this is the translation. It did not relent, but kept pleading with the only one, blessed be, or mercy to the point of offering his own life for the sake of, the Israel, of Israel. As it is written, and if not, bloat me, I mentioned that, I pray you out of your book which you have written. And then the Holy One, blessed be he, forgave the Israelite, as it is written, and Hashem relented of the evil, but Noah did not act as did Moses. He only pleaded to be saved and left for the word for the word to its fate. Guys, we all like Noah. You know, you look at Ukraine, you know, there are sanctions. There, there are so many things that happen in, in, in life, but we are we are not fighting for life of people. You know, I'm going to general, I, but we are lacking that consciousness. We are lacking that consciousness to really fight for every friend, every soul, every, every person that we know that maybe turn towards the right direction. We, we, we are lacking that fight because this is the consciousness of Noah. Um, today, we can connect with the consciousness of Moses that we, we, are, we are there. We are willing really to give our life for for the mission and that's something that uh, we we always praying for even in the shema it says that it's called mesirut nefesh it's like we are willing really to give away the the level of nefesh which is a sacrifice of the body the the, the nefesh is the part of the soul attached to the body and we are willing to, to give that in order for us really to, to do our own spiritual work. So it's all about this uh, sacrifice that we, we, you know, and it's gradual. As much as you are growing more in your spiritual elevation, yeah, if you had a chance to listen to Michael Berg, uh, last Shabbat lecture was, was enormous, enormous. I'm talking about uh, the level of responsibility that the minimum responsibility that each and every one of us promised before his coming 
to, to his body, to this physical world, was at least to give 51% of his intention, of his energy, of his time towards the benefit of humanity. <clears throat> exactly. So that's what we're saying. I don't remember such a promise. <laughs> I know. I don't remember me promising such a thing. 51% at least. I mean, the Kabbalists brought it to much higher levels. Depends on which level of Kabbalists is, but they brought it into the 90%, 95%. Till the whole being was all about sharing, wasn't about themselves anymore. But in order for us really to, to start feeling a purposeful life, we, we have to take more of that responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, 55, 51% means that um, I'm here. It's, it's called the mutual responsibility that we have for each other. You know, what happened right now in Ukraine and, and all those people that are getting killed and all this negativity and all this chaos and all this destruction is affecting humanity. You, you see it today more than ever. You see it immediately in the stock market. Boom, everything starts to fall. Now we can see with this digital world, we can see how everything affecting everything so easily. Yeah? Yeah, of course, we are in Canada. We are safe. It's a safe country. Uh, yeah, there, there are no real enemies in Canada, in a way. Yes, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but the moment you are getting stuck at home in the winter time, there is a new enemy that started to take control inside your mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the enemy that the Kabbalists talk about. That's the real opponent. It's not the physical enemy. It's like it's the, it's the enemy of the, the opponent that is drilling inside of us when we are closing four walls and starting to cause us really to limit us and causing us to feel so bad ourselves and so bad about who we are and what we did. And that's where depression started to take place. And, and, and what's the problem here? Because I'm, I'm not busy with helping others. Because if I will, will be busy helping and dedicating my time for this mutual responsibility, I would... I would actually, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm missing here? I would discover my uniqueness in such a level <clears throat> that I wouldn't let this opponent to ever, you know, put me into uh, and make me paralyzed. If it's winter or if it's summer, or whatever excuses, you know, the illusionary word trying to bring us, I won't let us dismiss that my, my true purpose, all our true purpose. So leadership is really the ability really to connect to that mutual responsibility. And, and that's really what Moses in his consciousness, because the moment they look at, they start looking at him, they say that the moment you watch someone the righteous, you start receiving his certainty. This is the reason we, you know, when the Rav and Karen were here, we, we, we were glued to them. We didn't want, you know, we didn't care about anything. We just wanted to be glued to them because you, you receive so much certainty. You, you receive. So the Israelites were, st they stick to Moses for that period to, and they reach that level. And uh, on Mount Sinai, all of them said, it's an article from the wisdom of truth about mutual responsibility. So it's explained that they all wear one mouth saying, Naseh and Ishma, they say, we're willing, we are completely willing to do a purposeful life. We are willing. They got to that, and that's where immortality snapped in. Immortality, they all experience immortality. They, they experience it twice, it says. The moment of the crossing of the Red Sea, says that this, the, the simplest servant among those Israelites was able to see more than any prophet throughout the generation. 
in that moment. Same experience was on, on Mount Sinai. And the both were leading by Moses, you know? So today, we all want to connect to, to this type of certainty. There is a strong relation between uh, Moshe, Mos, Mos, Moses, and Purim. So it says that Aman, he, he also, I mean, Aman, uh, which is, it's, it's the negative character of, of the story of Purim, the one that wanted to destroy consciousness. He said that he saw that the, the, the holy temple is about to be rebuilt and he wanted to prevent that. And he, he prevented that through uh, contaminating the Israelite consciousness and eventually wanting to destroy them. And then Mordechai, which is the, is the positive, is the superhero character, uh, he starts resisting him together with his wife, which was Esther. So there is a soulmate who wanted to prevent the, that destruction. But uh, it says that he was an astrologer and he knew that a week before his declaration is the death anniversary of, of Moses. So he, he thought for a second that it, it's a... Uh, it's a dormita, it means that it's a sign of death, it's a sign of a lower level of consciousness that the Israelite would be remembering that their uh, everlasting leader has left the world. But it already was inside their, their programming that Moshe was immortal. He was immortal. So as we celebrate a uh, uh, anniversary for any death anniversary of a Kabbalist, we celebrate it as a as a festival for us. It's a festival. It's like you, it's a day full of energy. It's a time day to manifest uh, great new things, which I recommend you to do to, to today meditation and tomorrow to uh, any any business venture that you have an idea to start. This is the, the moment. It's, it's a powerful day. All those days are powerful during the month of Adar. Mm -hmm. It's connected to, to Yosef HaTzadik. It's connected to, uh, to the manifestation level of Adar. It's the last month of the Zodiac here. It's the time of manifestation. So we all have the ability uh, really to, to take the, the light that exists on that day and, and deliver it. Deliver it. It says that as, as Mo, Moses was able to impact Esther and Mordechai with his energy and give them the, the certainty and give them the, the same vision that he had, that they must fight. And their fight eventually created an almost miracle uh, to the level that uh, Purim, it's considered to be the highest of opening. And that by coincidence is so close to the anniversary of, of Moshe Rabbeinu. So it says that the highest opening that exists in, in, in the cycle of the year, it's Purim, higher than Yom Kippurim, the day of autonomy, higher than Rosh Hashanah, the Rav said, higher than any other holiday. Why? Because it says that the awakening was from the vessel, you know? In, on Pesach, the awakening was from the creator. He saw the Israelites already like, you know, what do you say, kaput. They're already done. There is no way to get them up. So so the creator has to give them the free gift and lift them up. But on Purim, it was a decision of unity, of getting together that allow all of that to happen. Guys, you guys have any question? Anything you would like to me to highlight on Moshe? When was he born? Same day. As many special Kabbalists, they usually born and depart from the world in the same day, unless they see a different important day that they have to depart in order to, to, to create a, a, 
to create a window on that day that this day is going to remain only for the entire rest of the calendar. So, yeah, so many of them just, leave, you know, born and live on the same day because they're showing that death is under their decision, under their control. I'm going to prepare another section from the Zohar, from Vaikra, on the departure of, uh, of Moshe. I have a question. Yes, please. So I was under... No. Hi, everyone. No. <laughs> I was under the impression that there was a part of Moshe's soul inside of all of us. And now after hearing this lecture or this class, my understanding has shifted a little bit because you're saying that the Israelites were a part of him. So I guess I don't really have a question so much as I'm just curious to understand, like, what's the interconnection between Moshe specifically? I feel like he's more inside of all of us than some of the others at Akeem that we look to. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, Moshe is definitely represent the perfect itself that exists, you know, it's like uh, as our soul is uh, a piece of stone from the mountain called creator, this is how the, the Kabbalists describe it to, to give us the understanding. So yeah, we are not the mountain, but we definitely are part of the mountain, yeah? Mm -hmm. So as Moses knew that the Israelite is part of him and he inclusive of all of them together, we, we have this spark uh, of Moses inside of us, but uh, probably to the level that it's dormant. Otherwise, we, we would probably devote most of our energy towards you know, changing humanity. Yeah. Okay. So three eighty five. Let's look for Vika three eighty five. More questions? I have um I have a question. Please. Hi, I'm Siobhan. Hi. Okay, so you said that um every generation, Moses and the spirit of Moshe represents himself or manifests himself? It might seem like a silly question, but is there like somebody who identifies like, okay, that's the guy of this yeah. generation? Or is that what you're, is that what you try to explain me when you say that? Uh, I mean, probably this question won't be awakened by anyone else that, that's studying Kabbalah because, you know, because only over there it's kind of declared but, you know, there are many religions even believe that uh, there is a potential, what we call Messiah for every generation. And the reason why it doesn't take place is because, again, humanity didn't take the, uh, the, the steps really to get there. Even though there was an opening, there was an opening, but boom, missing the point, yeah? Uh, so definitely, you, what, what could be into that? It's to, to see who is the characters. Of course, I don't know if you will be able to, to have that knowledge, but who is the characters that made the most spiritual influence on this world, on our generation? So that's where you get your answer usually. But it's hard to even measure that, isn't it? You know? Yeah, some people thought you will think maybe Tony Robbins is the Messiah, you know? <laughs> Because he has millions of followers and he has like this uh, huge voice, you know, and he's so charismatic. But Moses wasn't charismatic, he was stuttered. He couldn't even speak right, you know. <laughs> so it's not necessarily uh, something that needs to be identified by, uh, by our five senses. But there is someone out there that what the work that he does is vibrating in such a magnitude that is, is causing the world to move forward. Yeah? Who is it? I have some clues, but, uh, you know, it's my opinion. It's not necessarily, you know, 
the opinion that you're going to agree with. <laughs> <laughs> so let's read the synopsis. Rabbi Chia says that since Moses, there has been no generation like his who beheld the glory of God. At that time, even a maid saw the parting of, of the sea, what Ezekiel uh, could not see. If those people in the desert had such wisdom, how much more as Rabbi Shimon and those who study with him? In the future, when Rabbi Shimon has departed, people will seek words of wisdom, but they will be hidden. And there will be no one to reveal the depths of wisdom found in the Torah. Rabbi Yehuda says that at the time of the Messiah, God will reveal the deep mysteries of the Torah. And everyone will know God from the least of them to the greatest of them. So it means this is the end goal that, you know, uh, the billionaires will admit that they are not really God, even though they are in this ego trip. The doctors also, all the physicians that, you know, doctors do. Actors, all of them, they suddenly go, wow, I'm not God. There is, a, there is something higher. So it's a mikatan that gadot. So it's like, and all, even the simple people, all of, all of the people uh, in the right timing, when all the curtains will be removed, will figure out, wow, there is, this is the essence of the creator. So, Atach Rabbi Chiyav Amar, ויאמר השם אל משה נחש שוחב עם אבותיך וגומר ככה זה כה זמנה דבר משה קיים בעלמה אבל מחה בידי עוד ישראל בגין דלה ישתה כחון בחיובה כמה קודשה ברכו ובגין משה ישתה כך בניהו לא יהיה כי הוא דרה עד דרה דייתה מלכה משיכה דייחמה יהיה קרה דקודשה ברכו כבייתה יהוד עינון דבקו מה דלי דבקי דרין אחרונים רבי חייה open the discussion with the verse and השם said to Moses behold you you shall sleep with your fathers. Come and see. As long as Moses was live in the world, the admonished Israel, admonished Israel, not to be found sinful before the Holy One. Bless be. Since Moses was among them, there is no generation like that one until the generation when King Messiah will come. Who beholds the glory of the Holy One, blessed be he, like they did, because they attained what no other generation did. It's pretty clear. we have learned that a maid saw on the sea what the eye of the prophet scale not, could not. If the maids reach those far, all the more so wives, wives of Israel, and their children even more, and the men even more, the Sanhedrin, all the more, and, and the chiefs even more, and all more so the supernal, faithful prophet Moshe. So he's just telling us, if a maid saw that much on the exodus of Fiji on, on Mount Sinai, imagine yourself what saw really the, the elevated people who is above everyone, the prophet Moshe. What he was able, what, you know, imagine yourself like seeing what Moshe used to see. He, he was the only, only soul that was communicating to creator in a, in a level called face to face face to face it means that he understood the face of the creator you know when you a face of the creator face means in hebrew pnim it's it's he, he saw the internal essence of the creator now if those merchants in this desert uttered such wisdom, all the more so the sages of the generation, and even more those who stay with Rabbi Shimon and study from him very day, all the more so Rabbi Shimon, who is above everyone. 
So it's it's comparing us, you know, the the admiration here for Rabbi Shimon, who, who like the students that were near him. After every wisdom that he he put together and download for them, he used, they used to say, imagine yourself, you like giving like this amazing energy to your students, suddenly they answer to you and say, oh my God, what will happen in the world when you're going to leave the world, when you're going to die? This is how they react to him. <laughs> Every time they, you know, they, they understood that the, mo the moment he will depart from the world and going to take all his energy away, the, the world is going to be completely naked. So every time he says something enormous to them, that's what they felt. And 387, after Moses, Moses died, it is written, and these people will rise up and go astray. All to the world when Rabbi Shimon will depart from it, when the, the spring of wisdom will be sealed from the world, when men will seek words of wisdom, but there will be no, be none to utter to hooter it. The whole world will hear in the Torah, there shall be none to awaken it with wisdom. Of that time it says, and if the whole congregation of Israel seen through ignorance, if they seen through ignorance of the Torah, it is because they will not know its way. Why? Because the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly for there will be no one reveal the depth of the Torah and its way, all to the generation then in, in the world. So I think in a way we all need to say that, that we, we're afraid that, God forbid, you know, the, the wisdom will, will, will stop. We need to be afraid, you know, that... Uh, how, how do how do we make sure that uh, Michael and Monica will continue to bring so many more secrets and all the teachers, all the Kabbalistic teachers, they're all going to co continue to, to bestow all this amazing wisdom upon us more and more and more and more and more. We need to be afraid uh, from the stoppage of it. You know, there was a, 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 an amazing story of the Rav Ashlag, how everything started. He already accomplished a, a, a big level of uh, leadership in, in Poland before he came to Israel, before he was, you know, declared as a Kabbalist. He was very young then. And then he saw this vision in a dream where he saw like forces of destruction that coming. And they're about to, to destroy, to create enormous destruction to the world. And he also say, he saw himself holding a, a, a sword. And on that sword, there was the name of the Yudke Vavke. And he understood his responsibility. And after seeing this vision, he, he tried to convince about 300 families of his students to immigrate with him to Israel. And of course they trusted him. And they, they start thinking about immigrating. And then some other rabbis there in Poland, they were able to convince all of them to stay. And eventually he had to go just by himself. His wife came after. Uh, and he wasn't able really to, uh, maybe one family came with him. And that that's was actually before Second World War II. And what he saw was actually Hitler and his forces of, uh, of Avok and Cass. And that was the time that he decided to translate the Zohar. Yeah. And he understood 
that the the sword that he saw against against bringing all this negativity to the world is is the Zohar. It's the teachings of Kabbalah. He, he saw that, and in that moment, he said, "Okay, I try to save those family. Many of them were they died in the Holocaust, if not all, as many others, six millions just." Jews, but another 60 millions in, in the total war that died. Tremendous. So imagine yourself that you have this vision that there is something that you are going to be able to do. You, you get this vision to see, wow, look what's going on in the world and I can do something about it. What would you do? So we need to think this way, because this was the thought of Moses. This was the thought of the Rav Ashlag. And of course, what the Rav Ashlag started was the Kabbalah Center in 1922. And that's allowed to, to, uh, to create, in the past 100 years, the, the biggest spiritual revolution ever happened in the world. You know? It says that they always will be able to teach single few the teachings. But now we're in level that hundreds of thousands of people are studying. So it's amazing. It's still small. We have to reach the, the millions and billions of people. And we'll get there. If, if we understand the responsibility, and if we beg Moses today to, to give us, to awaken his spark inside of us, so we can be at least 51% of who we are, of a majority of who we are is for the sake of humanity and this mutual responsibility. I promise you, you're going to be fulfilled and happy. That's the promise. And if it doesn't work, come to me and I explain you how to be selfish again. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you all for coming. Uh, I really recommend to uh, light a candle. Uh, maybe let's light together a candle, but you also can light it to uh, your place. Uh, lighting a candle means that uh, allowing the soul of, of Moses to, to be present around you so you can connect to it, you can tap into it. One second, I'm going to bring a candle. Hey, Rina! <laughs> <laughs> uh. Becky invited me. I, I snuck in. <laughs> You're so welcome to be here. <laughs> it's amazing. Rita, she looks yeah. familiar. Yeah, Rita's from Florida, but she can't get ah. enough of us. <laughs> We're gonna move you. We're gonna move you to the cold. We should. We need her. She's very active in the community. All right, guys. So Schuto Shel Moshe Rabenu. Amen. Tagen Alenu. Amen. 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 Who is that? Natalie. Hi, darling. Hi, Katie. How are you? <laughs> good, good. It's been a while. I know. I know. Okay, I guess we're ready for bed. I, I do, but before going to bed, do five minutes meditation, please. Okay? Yeah. And it's a Shabbat Zachor, okay? It's a Shabbat that we're going to remove all the doubts. All the forces of Amalek. Okay, guys. Love you all. Take care. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Love Thank you, David. Thank you. See you. See ya. Good night.